Hey guys, this is Sudha. Welcome to my Egypt travel series. Good morning. It's day 4 in Egypt. We are still in Cairo today and it's 6:30 in the morning and we are planning to go to Karnak temple. Uh, we've just headed out of our hotel but we're not able to find any auto or shared taxi drive or taxis to take us there. It's traveling by the local shared taxi here. As soon as we enter Karnak temple, we came across these boats. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. We are here at Karnak temple. We were dropped off at the gate by the shared taxi uh, for 5 pounds, for 5 Egyptian pounds. So that's quite a sweet deal. So after having visited a couple of temples here, there is something called pylons. Um, I've understood that pylons are nothing but the exterior walls uh, that lead us into a room or a chamber so i think one of the it's one of the most um, iconic architectural styles uh, of the pharaoh's generation where um, they have these pylons uh, built up and this temple karnak temple has about eight pylons belonging to amun ra okay it's a goat head with a lion body so if you see there are one, two, three, four pylons right here. How pretty is this row of animals? It's a goat head with lion body. This is new. I've seen sphinxes which are human face and lion body, but this is new. This one seems to have an extra horn on the top. This is the temple of Ramses III. So far Ramses II is the most popular one. But uh, this is the temple of Ramses III. Just so perfect. These statues are destroyed, but these are intact. And when, when the statues have their arms crossed like that, it means they belong to the royal family. So that's a symbol of uh, being born into a royal family. After the second pylon, we have 134 columns of these open papyrus buds and closed papyrus buds so if we see on the top it's open so the papyrus bud is open here so there is this first row that is open uh, that has open papyrus buds and then this is the second row which has second i think almost all the other rows have closed papyrus buds so such an impressive view here each column is so huge i just can't fathom how huge these are How pretty are these columns? I mean, there are 134 of these and look at the size of each one of these. I mean, it's just so marvelous. And I can't believe that I am the only one here in this entire um, area of columns. There are lots of scenes from daily life. Pharaohs had conducted their life. Um, which gods did they um, pray to? and each god has uh, some or the other significance so on all the temples here in egypt different gods like goddess sekhmet there's isis there's um, amun ra there's anubis so there are lots of these gods and goddesses that have a lot of influence on the people as well as the pharaohs that lived here so 
it's just a beautiful piece of um, history and uh, I just can't believe that I am here witnessing it today. Just out of the second pylon and entering the third courtyard and here there are two obelisks constructed during the time of Tutmos. Another obelisk found here, this is smaller than the others and seems to have been restored but still some impressive cartouches and hieroglyphics. Another pylon. All these are hieroglyphics and they all mean something. Um, but I think only Egyptologists can read and understand what all of these mean. So there must be some chants uh, to praise the gods. Such neat hieroglyphics carved into this massive 28 meters obelisk. There are rows of hieroglyphics written here and then there's one big row of hieroglyphics just in the center. It's just such a beautiful thing of architecture to look at. The carvings are still so neat in some portions, especially here. That's the key of life and then the eye of aura. So there are a lot of inscriptions here on this massive obelisk. So this is something new. So this is a cartouche. So this is a name of a person. Um, but there's also a head on top of the cartouche. And they're all different. If, if you just see these two right here. The symbols inside are different, which means these are names of different persons. So all these Egyptian temples, they're a combination of two factors. One is how massive these structures are and how grand these structures are. And the second uh, factor is that even though these are grand structures, they have intricate carvings all over. So some people have written, carved their names. Uh, apparently, uh, Sekith and Monge came to this in 1862. Louis came in 1890. So I think this was the time when Britishers were ruling and then some guys just took the liberty to write their names, to carve their names in such historic place. So I've just come to the Mummification Museum where they curate and showcase the artful mummification techniques, the concept of embalming and the steps that are used for mummification. So we just, it's on the bank of River Nile and yeah, I'm just so curious to know how the mummification process happens. Mummification process includes purifying the body with sacred water, smearing bandages with molten resin, wrapping the mummy with linen bandages. Here Anubis tends the mummy in the presence of Isis and Nephthys. Here relatives and friends follow the deceased. This scene depicts the mummy being dragged by four oxen on a sledge. The funerary equipment preceded by the mourners. Here, Thoth watches weighing of the heart. It is believed that the soul visits mummy and gives her life again. 
there's only one extremely well preserved human mummy present in this museum. This is the sarcophagus and mummy of the high priest of Amun Re and the general of army Maserati. So his name is Maserati which was found in their Ebahari. Museum also displayed mummification tools like scissors, brush, puncture and needle to sew the incision done on the abdomen. Four alabaster canopic jars shown here were used to preserve lungs, liver, intestine and stomach of the deceased. Along with humans, a lot of animals were mummified as well. Here we can see a goat's mummy with a cartonage mask. These masks are supposed to have features of the deceased. Of all the mummified objects, I was amazed most by this crocodile. Crocodiles were considered the sacred animal of god Sobek. Here we see a bed which was used in the mummification process. The front of the bed is decorated with two lion heads and this bed is from 1500 BC. This is a mummy of a fish and this is a baby crocodile. This is the sign of Ark which is the symbol of life. We can spot this symbol in various temples of Egypt. Here we see various materials used in mummification like stuffing material, salts, sawdust, ointments, linen bandages, resin and turpentine. This is a vertical section of skull stuffed with linen cloth to fill the cavity from where the brain was removed. All these are different funerary objects that were placed inside the sarcophagus of mummies. This is a winged scarab which is a symbol of rebirth and eternity. This is the mummy board of the high priest Maserati whose mummy we saw earlier on. And this is the lid of the coffin of Maserati. Just back from the mummification museum and I must tell you that this is one of the best places I've ever seen so far because they've explained the process so well 
I think all this while there was a little confusion as to how the features were so well preserved, the bodies were so well preserved. Yeah, they they use resin to keep the features intact. It's one real mummy, and there's mummies of crocodiles and cats. So I think it's a very good place and a must visit while you're here in Luxor. Back at the vegetarian restaurant. Uh, but today we've taken uh, falafel sandwiches so it's good that we are finding some vegetarian food here so i have arrived in aswan today um, we took a train from luxor to aswan and uh, we checked into our hotel and we are just here by the river nile it's the evening here and lots of falukas there and motor boats that are sailing quite a nice sight here the sun is about to set 